Hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I'm thrilled to kick off my series on the selected gross pathology of the dog with a tour through the cardiovascular system. As I'm an incurable romantic, I often start my lectures off with the cardiovascular system. But before we get into it, I got to thank all of my friends and colleagues, as I always do, who have provided me these great images over the years, either directly or through online collections, which allow me to put these lectures together. Let's start with the congenital diseases of the dog. In the dog, the most common congenital cardiovascular disease is the patent ductus arteriosus. Number two is aortic stenosis, and number three is pulmonic stenosis, if you're keeping track. When we talk about PDAs, or patent ductus arteriosus, it arises from a structure that shouldn't be there. Normally at birth, in most animals, the ductus arteriosus will slam shut and eventually become a small strip of fibrous connective tissue called the ligamentum arteriosum, which is going to be important when we get into the gastrointestinal system and talk about congenital problems there. But if it stays open, which most often is seen in young, female, small breed dogs, you get patency between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And the, initially, the high pressure blood of the aorta will come back through this tube into the pulmonary artery and the right ventricle, causing dilation, as we see here, maybe hypertrophy over time. It's a left to right shunt, but ultimately, as the lungs fill up with fluid and the animal develops pulmonary hypertension, it can become a right to left shunt. And then the dilation that you see in the right atrium and ventricle will also spill over to the left atrium and ventricle, and you'll have biventricular dilatation. Normally, the outline of the heart should be fairly straight here. So whenever you see this sort of waist right here and a bulge in this region, you're looking at right ventricular dilatation. You can also see a similar lesion in pulmonary stenosis as that right ventricle has to push against a narrowed opening into the pulmonary artery. So this is patent ductus arteriosus. Used to be a real problem. Nowadays, it's much easier. People go in and they put a constrictor on this and over time, it narrows down and shuts down the PDA and the animal will do fine. Now, when we talk about production animals, horses, especially cattle, uh, atrial or ventricular defects are much more common and in cattle a ventricular septal defect is probably the most congenital uh, cardiac defect. It's not seen that often in dogs. Uh, it's most often seen in English Bulldogs which have lots of problems and Keesons and related breeds. This is a pretty small one so this animal may not be an athlete but it may live a quiet lifespan. Remember when you see ventricular defects, especially in this normal area, which is up high, right under the valves, you want to start looking for other uh, congenital defects because you might be lucky. Ventricular septal defects are often uh, parts of more complex defects like the Tetralogy of Fallot or Eisenmenger syndrome. As we said before, dogs can live with small defects like this. I haven't mentioned, and we're going to talk about cats. I mentioned production animals, so I should talk about cats. Cats, when we talk about congenital diseases, will get much more into diseases of the valves, which give rise to large hearts. You know, the, the presence of a septal defect in a fetal animal causes absolutely no problem because the left and the right ventricular pressure is equal at birth due to the open foramenal valley, the open ductus arteriosus. It's, it's only after birth that you start to notice problems associated with heart defects. This is a great lesion we see in almost every animal species we need to talk about in the dog. And if you look, not even closely, but if you look at this image, 
we focused on these incrustations on the valves. These are incrustations of fibrin, bacteria, and a couple neutrophils. The disease is vegetative valvular endocarditis, and the morphologic diagnosis is a fibrinosuppurative valvulitis. In the majority of cases, these are clinically occult findings. You may have other cardiac lesions as a result of little bits of fibrin getting sucked into the ostea of the coronary arteries uh, during diastole and causing septic infarction in the myocardium. Now, the things that you want to look for in cases of valvular endocarditis, they're almost always associated with two things. Number one is a history of hospitalization, especially with an indwelling catheter. Okay, the easiest way to get bacteria into the bloodstream is to put an indwelling catheter. Okay, second thing that often accompanies this is corticosteroid administration. Okay, you need a bit of immunosuppression and access for the bacteria for it to get in the systemic circulation. Um, may be associated with congenital heart defects. It is not associated with a couple of things. One is endocardiosis. Everybody's got endocardiosis. Not that many dogs get uh, valvular endocarditis. So, but a congenital heart defect like pulmonic stenosis or aortic stenosis can give rise to or at least provide the turbulence necessary for development of vegetative valvular endocarditis. I'm not a big fan of uh, that this is the result of periodontal disease in a dog. Periodontal disease may form a portal, but you also have to have the concomitant immunosuppression. A lot of animals get their teeth cleaned. I've seen some horrible teeth in my time. You open these animals up, their hearts are absolutely clean. Now, when we talk about the potential agents for vegetative valvular endocarditis, um, there you can never go wrong with staph, strep, or a coliform. In any species, staph, strep, or coliform, staph, strep, or coliform, there's usually some sort of strep that's specific to the species. In the dog, it's strep canis. And we'll talk about strep canis when we get into some other diseases like toxic shock syndrome and, and Sharpays. But strep canis is a good one. Strep likes to, likes to make fibrin. Staph, strep, and coliform. Can't go wrong. But a lot of species have a couple of others that you need to know. In the dog, we want to think about, oddly enough, erysipelothrix rusiopathy. Uh, that's one we, we always think about in pigs, but it can do it in dogs. And then I also want to bring your attention to Bartonella. Bartonella vincini and Bartonella quintana are well known to cause vegetative valvular endocarditis with some significant remodeling of the valves on the aortic side. Not only do we see this in dogs, it has also been identified in people that work closely with dogs. So this is vegetative valvular endocarditis, staph, strep, E. coli. I mentioned endocardiosis. It's a very, very common lesion in dogs and is due to the buildup of uh, glucosaminoglycans and other polysaccharides within the matrix of the valve over time. It is an age-related finding. We see this very, very commonly, usually subclinically in older dogs and doesn't cause much of a problem. Yes, you have deformity of the valves. You can get some squirting back of blood resulting in subendothelial fibrosis, the so-called jet lesions in the uh, subendocardium of the overlying atria squirt a little blood back, um, but it usually doesn't cause much of a problem. Common, common incidental finding in older dogs. We see this in a lot of other species too. Dogs are probably best known for valvular endocardiosis. And remember, this is probably not going to give rise to vegetative valvular endocarditis. Here's an absolutely fantastic picture by Dr. Santiago Diab, and I love this picture. And what we're looking at is the heart of a six-month-old puppy. And the endocardium and much of the myocardium has been replaced by this white 
fibrous connective tissue. Okay, it's just collagen. And you can see that the heart is sort of flabby and it's lost its tone. It's just sort of laying blah right there on the light table. And this is a six month old puppy. And this is the result of canine parvovirus type two infection in the dog. In the young dog, there are a number of sites which decrease as the animal ages even to a month of age, um, where canine parvovirus, which is a replication defective virus, can infect. It needs cells in a certain stage of the cell cycle. And it can always get them in lymph nodes in the bone marrow. It can get them in certain parts of the brain uh, at birth. And for the first two weeks, there are a number of myocytes in this stage of the cell cycle that allows canine parvovirus to infect them. So they get infected, they die off, they, they also cause inflammation. So you're going to see lymphocytes and plasma cells at that time too, along with in these two-week-old animals, you're going to see beautiful parvoviral inclusions. Okay, and then, but it doesn't kill the animal. You have loss of myofibers, you have replacement by fibrosis. But the problem occurs as the animal grows, as the animal becomes more active, becomes more of an athlete, and it actually uh, becomes too active for the amount of fibrous connective tissue in the heart. So most of the deaths that we see related to parvoviral myocarditis are gonna be in animals four to six months of age, rather than those two-week-old puppies. Now you see a lot of other disease due to canine parvovirus in this age group as well. You'll see severe gastroenteritis, immunosuppression. But if you look at the heart of an animal that was infected as a very young puppy with canine parvovirus, this is a classic and beautiful picture. Thank you so much, Dr. Diab, for, for, for taking this picture and making it available. Okay, this is a, a fairly uncommon disease. You don't see a lot of granulomas in the uh, hearts of the dog. But in German Shepherds, which have some sort of probably undocumented or un, uh, uh, subclinical immunosuppression, um, you see granulomas. And you'll see them in other organs as well. You may see them in the liver, lungs, and the kidney. And this is due to a particular species of aspergillus, aspergillus terius. You don't hear much of it outside of the dog literature. And it's usually restricted to German shepherds. So there's something within German shepherds that, that make them susceptible to this particular disease. And it's a great lesion. The aspergillus terius has a characteristic morphology and tissue with uh, these sort of pipe stem figures and great gross lesions. Aspergillus terius in a dog. And this particular picture was taken in Italy by Dr. Barbara Brunetti. And it's just a fantastic, fantastic image. Well, we have a big boggy heart. We have this waist here, so we know that there's right ventricular dilatation. There's left ventricular dilatation here. Um, there's a lot of fibrosis. The myocardium is pale. And this is a dog with cardiomyopathy. And we talk a lot about cats with cardiomyopathy, but dog cardiomyopathy has been identified for many, many years. There are a number of large breed dogs that suffer their own breed specific forms of cardiomyopathy, including Dobermans, Great Danes, Boxers. We're going to look at a special type of boxer cardiomyopathy in a minute. Also, English Cocker Spaniels, Irish Wolfhounds, Newfoundlands, Airedales. Um, and the cause of these um, are generally unknown. It's thought you know, because they are breed specific, it's probably genetic. And there are markers which have been identified, but most of the genetic mutations have not been worked out. Dobermans, for example, have elevated levels of metalloproteinases and neutrophil elastin in the myocardium, as well as a deficient myocardial mitochondrial ATP burst. Uh, the English cockers have 
abnormalities of the fourth component of complements. Not thought to be causative, but it can help to identify dogs. Um, one of the the clinical pathology markers that we see that can be identified in all of these animals and is used in humans, which identifies myocardial stretching and can be used to help identify these cases and monitor their progress is BNP or B-type natriuretic peptide, which the heart produces or the ventricle produces in response to increased mechanical load and wall stretching. Histologically, they divide them into two types. You have the attenuated wavy, fire type, wavy fiber type and the fatty infiltration slash degenerative type. Now, for me, my main histologic criteria for cardiomyopathy, which I see in a lot of different species, including ferrets and, and primates and, and rats and mice, is the presence of fiber loss and resulting fibrosis. You only get so many myofibers in your life. When you lose them, it's replaced by, by fibrous connective tissue. If I'm thinking about cardiomyopathy, the first thing that I'm going to do in the heart is I'm going to get a good massage, which will show me areas where myofibers have been lost. Oftentimes, you'll see them start around vessels. You'll see them in the hardest working parts of the heart, which include the papillary muscles, and they'll go from there. But that's a great thing when you're thinking about early or maybe subclinical cardiomyopathy to go and get that Masson's trichrome. Okay, we talked about the fatty infiltration slash degenerative types, and, and this is a particular type of uh, cardiomyopathy that's seen in a number of species, including people. And this is a great picture by Sylvia Ferguson when she was at the University of Georgia. And you can see the fatty infiltration of the right ventricle of the heart of this boxer. It's very classic for boxers. And the condition is known as arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. There was a great write-up uh, last year in the Wednesday Slide Conference in 2018 uh, in a horse. It's primarily been seen in dogs and people. The genetics are not totally worked out, but it appears to be in the dog a defect like in people of desmosomes and because of the distensibility of these desmosomes uh, I'm mean, sorry the distensibility of the right ventricle it almost always is seen in the right ventricle the myofiber separate it allows uh, the fat the normal fat of the heart to infiltrate the heart and ultimately as in this case replace those myofibers. So a desmosome problem causes arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. I just call it ARVC. And we see it occasionally here at the JPC in submitted hearts. It's a great reason why you're why when you cut in hearts, you're very careful. Young residents often will just take a bit here or a bit there or whatever and throw them in a cassette. Don't do that. Dissect carefully. Make sure you know what's right, what's left, um, and identify. Because the worst thing is when you get a piece of heart that's replaced by a lot of fat and you don't know whether it's right or left because you've been dealing with this condition. So be very careful in your approach to the hearts, especially frustrating when clinicians will do the post, you'll get an autopsy in a bottle, you'll say the heart looked bad and there's just random little square pieces and you can't tell where it came from. And you'll never be able to prove this disease without having good labeling and diagrams. Okay, let's move on to a disease of vessels throughout the body, primarily the coronary vessels. And I want you to look at these coronary vessels and look at these yellowish plaques. These are very characteristic of atherosclerosis. There's two substances that build up in arteries. One's mineral, and that's white, and one is fat, and that's yellow. Fat's actually white, 
But what happens over time is in these animals, they will develop these subintimal plaques of fat and they will attract macrophages and the macrophages will aggregate in these and start breaking down that fat. When you break down fat, you get a yellow color. So whenever you're looking at vessels, say is it white or is it yellow? If it's white, think mineral. If it's yellow, think atherosclerosis. In the dog, atherosclerosis is usually seen in animals with forms of hyperlipidemia. Okay, it's commonly seen in animals with hyperthy or hypothyroidism, idiopathic hypothyroidism, with decreased activation of lipoprotein lipase. It's also seen in animals with diabetes mellitus, which will result in hypercholesterolemia. That's not just enough. It's not just enough to have a lot of fat in your blood. You also have to have endothelial damage or a way from the, for that excess fat to get under the endothelial layer and into the intima of the vessel. And so what you usually see is you usually see these plaques and hyperlipidemic animals begin at the branches of vessels where there is normally shear stress. And then ultimately they will work their way back. Um, initially, the lipid gets under the endothelial layer and then it'll be damaged by various free radicals and that's what attracts the macrophages to cause these well-defined plaques within vessels throughout the body. The heart is a great place, maybe it's because of the branching of those vessels, but you can see it in any arterial in the body, uh, you can see it in the brain, especially circle of Willis, you can see it in the pro it's prostate, just anywhere and everybody's got lots of great pictures of this so if you're taking a certification exam um, this is one that certainly should be on your radar um, it's really not common uh, in many species you have to have predisposing disease in the dog it's only common in the natural form in man because of our terrible diets swine and certain types of birds like the white carno pigeon although you will see this in a lot of old citizens because people feed them um, all sorts of things uh, over the years. I would also mention that uh, miniature schnauzers may be predisposed. Um, they have a natural hyperlipidemia. They don't have to have uh, hypothyroidism to see these lesions. It's not a great model, and there aren't great models for uh, atherosclerosis in the human because the lipid in humans gen generally tends to be uh, in the intimal or in the subendothelial layer. And in dogs, these plaques tend to uh, eventually uh, take root in the mid to outer tunica media. Well, this is a very common parasite in many parts of the world. Um, generally in the heart, will live in the right ventricle as we see here, and this is Dyrophilaria imidis. It gives rise to many different syndromes, including that of right heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. If the animals are treated, these worms will die and they will shoot off into the lungs where they will form granulomas. Uh, in the right heart, they can interfere with the tricuspid valve. Um, you can see shearing of the red blood cells as they go through here, and it gives rise to a number of other secondary conditions, including glomerulonephritis and vena cava syndrome. Uh, in Europe, you want to think about angiostrongylus vasorum. So they have their own. This is one that you can imagine will give you, due to the mass of worms, a pressure overload of the right heart. And eventually, because of changes in the pulmonary arterial system and the formation of granulomas, you're going to get pulmonary hypertension and volume overload in the left heart. Um, in some cases, with the pulmonary hypertension, you will actually see diaphragmatic hypertrophy these particular cases because of the difficulty these animals have in breathing in later stages of the disease. But one of the classic lesions that you'll see with heartworm disease and to a lesser extent angiostrongylus vasorum 
is this wrinkling of the endocardium of the pulmonary artery. Here's your worm here, and you can see that the uh, endothelium is thrown into folds. Histologically, we call this villar pulmonary endarteritis because the endothelium forms little villa, villar-like structures. Now, it's not known, actually, it's been well documented that this is associated with heartworms. It's not known whether it's the presence of heartworms. I like that theory. But uh, there is also a second theory that the, uh, uh, this change may be bacterial in origin because these heartworms often call, carry a bacterium with them uh, from the genus Wolbachia, which may elaborate some form of toxin or inflammatory mediator that causes this disease. But it's a classic lesion, pulmonary villar endarteritis associated with heartworms. And one of the other things that I often see in animals with heartworm because of the pulmonary hypertension, here's somebody has opened up the arteries of the caudal lung lobes, which are especially affected. You can see how tortuous they are. They're thickened, and they contain thrombi. And this is seen over time as a result of the pulmonary hypertension. But look at the brownish discoloration of these lungs. This animal might have granulomas in them as well, may be treated, but it's very characteristic for the lungs in these chronic heartworm cases to develop a very brownish appearance. You may or may not see heart failure cells, but they get dark, they get brown, and it's common with heartworm disease. Okay, let's finish up the diseases of the cardiovascular system with some neoplasms. I usually save neoplasms to the end of every section, and one of the classic neoplasms of the dog heart is hemangiosarcoma. The right atrium, the liver, and the spleen are the the three most common sites for development of this tumor. When it develops in the right atrium, it can do a number of things. It can go through the atrium and spread along the pericardial surface and you will get hemoperitonin or blood within the pericardial sac. That's probably what's happened here. We can see a lot of fibrous tags which tell me that there is fluid, chronic fluid within the pericardial sac and the presence of this extensive hemangiosarcoma suggests that there has been rupture of the right atrium. Um, the other thing that will happen, if you have a tumor in the right atrium and it, a little piece breaks off and hemangiosarcomas always break off, well, what are they going to do? They're going to shoot into the right ventricle and into the pulmonary artery and they're going to seed the lungs. So when you see it in the heart, the next tissue you're going to go to is the lungs because it's probably going to be there as well. It's number one primary cardiac tumor of dogs, most commonly seen in large breed dogs, German Shepherds, uh, Golden Retrievers, Labrador Retrievers are overrepresented. Um, you often will see uh, this tumor in multiple organs. And I mentioned spleen, liver, and lung. You know, there's two camps that say whether it's multicentric or metastatic, I think it's metastatic. But uh, this is one that people are divided as to whether it arises in multiple organs at the same time. Okay, I had to, to, uh, to turn this heart onto its side because of this gigantic neoplasm at the heart base. And please, don't call this a heart base tumor. Um, if you have a tumor on your big toe, does it fall into the classification of big toe tumors? It does not. But there are a lot of neoplasms that will manifest at the heart base. And your rule outs for this particular location are going to obviously include hemangiosarcoma, as we just saw. But we're going to look for thyroid carcinomas. Thyroid often uh, invades vessels and will go to the heart base and there's also a lot of ectopic thyroid tissue at the heart base and when you have ectopic tissue it's about 40 percent more likely to develop a tumor than in its normal spot so thyroid carcinomas 
the chemodectomas, or neuroendocrine carcinomas, or paragangliomas, all names for tumors that people also call carotid body or aortic body tumors. These are chemoreceptor organs, which are in the area of the base of the heart and along the carotid arteries, and commonly will form large masses that ultimately will compress the aorta and the pulmonary artery. A lymphoma. An ectopic parathyroid carcinoma. The last one's pretty uncommon, but uh, you know these are very common neoplasms at the site. Up to 50% of dogs have ectopic thyroid tissue in the pericardium, so you know that's always a good one. So uh, um, in the, the chemoreceptor tumors, the carotid body tumors, are a little more malignant than the aortic body tumors. I just lump them all together in the chemo dectomas. They're not difficult to diagnose. They have a very characteristic appearance of nesting and packeting, and they should be strongly positive for synaptophysin um, and chromogranin because they are related to pheochromocytomas. It's the same group of tumors. You have that type of tissue throughout the body, and certainly you have a lot around the heart base. Just don't call the heart base tumor. You're going to make me very, very mad. Hey, let's look at this one thing right here. Here's your right ventricle. It's very dilated because chances are this big tumor has been pressing on the pulmonary artery. So this, we have dilation of the right ventricle due to pressure overload. It's always nice to, to pick up these little details in these pictures. Here's a great picture by Rob Osiboff. He's seen one. I've never seen any in the flesh. This is a tumor actually of the heart valve, and there's not much that's in heart valves. There's basically fibroblasts, and they produce sort of a ground substance. And this is when they went nuts. This is a valvular myxoma. Remember, the ground substance is produced by fibroblasts, just like collagen. But in the heart valves, they produce the ground substance. And here's one. And I think I've seen or heard of three of these. So they're just not very common. It's a rarity, but uh, it's a fun picture. Can we talk for a moment about the big vessels of the body? And can we talk for a moment about thrombosis? Whether we're talking about thrombosis of the, uh, uh, the portal vein or we talk about thrombosis of the pulmonary artery. Um, there are four main causes of thrombosis. And this was pretty much elucidated in a great paper in VetPath back in 1995. It makes me feel so old by Tom Van Winkle, who is a fantastic pathologist who's now retired. But he left us a lot of great things as his contribution to veterinary pathology. And this paper was one of them. And he identified four major causes for thrombosis in large vessels, okay? Number one, which is a lot more prevalent then than it is now, is prednisone administration. Steroids inhibit tissue plasminogen activators. So uh, animals with steroid hepatopathy or given high doses of steroids will often be put into a coagulative state. The second thing is glomerulonephritis or any chronic kidney disease that results in loss of coagulation factors. So we can see with amyloidosis, we can see it with glomerulonephritis, we can actually see it with severe uh, chronic interstitial nephritis. And so if you're losing coagulation factors like uh, antithrombin, which goes out in the urine, then you're going to put these animals in a procoagulative state. The third is neoplasia of any type, because many neoplasms tend to metastasize through blood vessels, especially sarcomas. But I've seen bad carcinomas do them too. So when you have all of these abnormal cells floating through, perhaps producing some very abnormal factors, and they're in the systemic circulation, that will cause thrombosis. And the last one is pancreatitis. And, and uh, all I can imagine with pancreatitis, and certainly it's been correlated very well, is that the release of a lot of these digestive enzymes like uh, proteinases and lipases into the systemic circulation. Um, will result in a procoagulant effect. And, and I always say procoagulant because we see this blood vessel here. But actually, what happens is your procoagulant and your anticoagulants um, are going at the same time. So, so 
thrombi are being formed and they're being lysed. Probably the smaller ones are being lysed and we get left with the bigger ones. But just realize that even if you an animal has clinical signs, even has uh, radiographic signs uh, or CT signs of thrombi, you've got to get to them immediately. Letting one of these animals sit around is, is a no-no because they're throwing and they're lysing clots and you might miss. We tend to miss a lot of clots. We see a lot of DIC animals. We never see a lot of clots. That's because the anticoagulants are active as well. It's haywire in there in terms of coagulation. So just remember all that good stuff and the four causes of uh, thrombi formation. And I'm going to wind up this lecture with a non-lesion, but one that you are going to see a lot. And we're looking at the heart here and all of this sort of crystalline whitish material is barbiturate salts. Barbiturates were used to be used a lot of times to euthanize animals. And because they um, are basic salts, when they get into a slightly acidic environment like the body, they turn into free acids and they will crystallize. And you'll see these salts on the outside of the heart, on the inside of the heart, maybe on the pleura or something like that. Today, we use something that it's not, not uh, barbiturates, but a lot of the... Uh, and we don't see these barbiturate salts so much anymore, but it's a very characteristic histologic lesion that you're gonna see in animals that are euthanized with euthanasia solution, which go by the name of Fatal Plus, in case, just in case Fatal wasn't enough for you. Um, and what happens, people tend to overuse these because they want these animals to be really dead, especially in small animals like, like rabbits and ferrets. What you will see is if they do an intercardiac injection inside the heart, you are going to see crystallization and fracture of the red blood cells. They won't look like red blood cells anymore. They look like little brightly and of a crystal because of this hypertonic solution that hits them. And then oftentimes it gets into the pulmonary artery and it goes in and causes a tremendous change in the center of the lung lobe. It looks like edema um, and maybe in large vessels you are going to see something that looked like thrombi, but everything, all of the neutrophils are just dust. And it's this hypertonic solution. So don't get confused between the effects of euthanasia solution and true pulmonary thrombi, because you're going to see lesions that look like it, but when you look closely, it's like eh, everything's been dusted here. Um, it's looked like it was burned, and that's exactly sort of what happened. It's this really hypertonic, irritating solution, which will give you lesions in the heart and lesions in the lung, especially when practitioners use too much. Okay. Well, that brings us to the end of this lecture. In our le next lecture, we're going to talk about the endocrine system of the dog. I hope that you've enjoyed this lecture. I hope you'll come back for that one, and I wish you great health and a fantastic day.